a song book and turn to number 292. Oh, I'm sorry. The red book.
free, and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Same page, except on the other side. Let's say because he lives. <coughs>
and uh, ask you to be praying about that. That stuff begins on a Sunday morning, goes through Wednesday evening, and uh, this time, and so be in prayer about that. Remember to pray for those that are on our prayer list, and uh, is there any that we need to add this morning?
I want to begin reading in verse number 15. When you get there, would you stand with reference to the Word of God? Matthew 27 and verse number 15. Now at the feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, Have, have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. The chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But then they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water, washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. And then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. You can be seated this morning. My wife and I stood in Pilate's Hall in Israel when we were there. We stood there with <coughs> Brother Lester and Brother Ron and these people and their families that went, parts of their family that went. Stood there at that place known as the Fortress of Antonia, the place where this very passage that we read took place. Listen to a lady sing that song, the Via Dolorosa, and give you the glory bumps. Those goosebumps come up all over you when you're standing in a place uh, as that is and thinking about what went on there all those years before. We saw that road that led out of that place and all the way to Calvary. And uh, they, led the, they led the Lord out the sheep gate. And I about had to shout a bit when I figured out he was going to be led out the sheep gate, but he's coming back in the lion gate on the other side. But uh, we saw that road. We saw that, uh, that game board, if you will, that was etched into the stone on that Roman street where Roman soldiers would play games of torture and torment and even death. Uh, it was a game that had been started many years, days gone by, and even before this. And they used to play it with Roman soldiers who were new, just kids that had been uh, brought into the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 they were new soldiers. And they would pick one out and they would torture them and beat them and blindfold them and and eventually they would die at the hands of these Roman soldiers. It was a game to them. The, the Roman government finally eventually made them quit using soldiers to play this game because they were losing too many soldiers. And so we can't have that so then they would pick somebody off the street. This is the game they played with Jesus when they Press the crown of thorns into his head. Put the robe of royalty upon him. Mocked him. Spat in his face. Whipped him. And all of that took place, but just minutes before that, Pilate had had a conversation with Jesus. The meeting with Jesus left him asking a very important question, and it's the title of the sermon this morning. You'll find the question 
In the middle part of verse number 22, what shall I do then with Jesus? My prayer today is, is that this question will burn in our hearts, that God would write it on our hearts with the mighty finger of God. That we would get no rest and no sleep until we have made up our mind. What am I going to do with Jesus? That every lost person would have to make up their mind to accept Christ as their Savior. That every believer, under the sound of my voice this morning, would not be able to rest until we have surrendered our lives to the Lord. This meeting with Jesus, the pilot, it was a, it was powerful, but I want you to first of all notice something. This meeting was powerful, but it was not out of the ordinary. The fortress of Antonia stands there at the northern, in the northern wall of Jerusalem, and uh, just, uh, just, I think if I can remember correctly, if I have my bearings right, it's just north of the temple and uh, the Temple Mount, and it's there, that fortress of Antonia, it was made for dignitaries, for kings and princes to uh, have a place to stay when they visited Jerusalem. Pilate was there because of the holiday festivities. He was there because of the Passover feast that was going on uh, at this time. And that's where he stayed. That was customary. It was a familiar place to him. He also knew that there would be prisoners there. There almost always was. He also knew that it was a custom that Pilate, the governor, would release one of the prisoners at the beckoning of the people. It was customary. Nothing here out of the ordinary. He knew all about this before he got there. Can I submit to you this morning that church can be, can be something that's very ordinary. Church services can be something that's, uh, that's very customary. Uh, that, uh, that it's not out of the ordinary. When you came this morning, whether you're saved or lost, you pretty much knew what was going to happen here. We were going to do Sunday school like we always have. We're going to do a little bit of singing like we always have. Somebody's going to preach uh, just like there always is. It's the same thing. You knew what to expect when you came to church this morning. But this time it was different for Pilate. Because he had had an encounter with a man named Jesus. He said, which is called the Christ. Can I tell you this morning, he wasn't only called Christ, he is the Christ. Yeah. It's different because he had an encounter. He looked outside the walls of, uh, uh, of, the, of the fortress there. And he saw the political world. Uh, set ablaze by this man named Jesus. He looked over here on this side and his wife was all uh, was all shook up because of this man Jesus and he began to think on these things and admittedly saw an innocency and a righteousness in Jesus Christ that he had not seen before, not witnessed before in any other. Barnabas was this notable prisoner, but this man Jesus, what am I going to do with him? What shall I do with Jesus? If you're here today and you're lost and not saved, I hope that today is not just a customary meeting of the church for you. But as you sit today and contemplate the volatile political situation outside the walls of this church house, and how that... Uh, that Christ has the political world all shook up in our day just as he did back then. As you look over here or over there and see believers in the house of God stirred up and, uh, and moved by the things of God and as you contemplate the sinlessness and righteousness of this man that is called the Christ and 
When you think about His sacrificial death at Calvary and His powerful resurrection at Joseph's tomb and His position of sovereignty as He sits at the right hand of God today, I pray that you'll come to a place where you have to answer the question, what am I going to do with Jesus? Pilate was faced with a serious and consequential decision. It's as simple as this. You're Pilate, you're thinking, if I turn Barabbas loose, there's an injustice done. This man is a notable criminal. He's, uh, he, he's deserving of death. If I turn him loose, an injustice has been done. On the other hand, if I turn Jesus loose, it may be political and social suicide for me. There may be some here today that are lost and at the point of decision, what are you going to do with Jesus? And on one hand, the whole idea of salvation by grace seems like an injustice, doesn't it? The idea that a person could live in sin and wickedness his whole life and be evil his whole life and get saved at the end of his life and be born again at the end of his life and get into heaven after all that he has done seems like an injustice. And that, that's exactly what happened to that thief that was hanging on the cross beside Jesus admittedly said, we deserve everything that we're given. But Lord, remember me when thou enterest into thy kingdom. It's not fair. It's not fair. And by the way, all of us are just like that thief, just like that person that gets saved at the end of their life after having lived a whole life of wickedness. We're all depraved. We're all in the same boat. It's all the same for any of us. If it wasn't fair for Jesus to save that thief hanging on the cross, it's not fair for Him to save you either. But the Bible says that God is just and the justifier of all of them that believe upon Him. How in the world can that be just? It's as simple as this. There had to be a punishment for sin, and that punishment was carried out, but God in His infinite grace and wisdom decided that it would be, that it would be ordained that Jesus would, would take our punishment and would pay the price for our sin. He became our substitute. All we have to do is accept the gift. Preacher, it's not fair. I don't deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be forgiven. None of us do. But wouldn't it be a tragedy? Wouldn't it be a shame after all that Jesus has done for you for you to miss heaven? Seems like an injustice. At the same time, to accept Christ seems like it may be social suicide for some people. My life will never be the same. It will never amount to anything. I'll be lonely. All my friends are going to forsake me if I get saved. Can I tell you that God, whenever you're born again, He changes your perspective. He'll give you a new heart. He'll give you a new life. By the way, He gives you a new people. Those people you've been going to church with down at the house of God before you got saved, all of a sudden they take on a whole new meaning. That's your support group. That's your circle of friends. That's your, that's your people. What are you going to do with Jesus? In this story, in this text, to avoid the real issue, to avoid having to deal with the real issue, Pilate tried to ceremoniously, ceremonial, ceremoniously, is that right? Or ceremonially, wash away his own sin. Verse 24, look at it again. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, 
saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Just take a, make a little ceremony, declare yourself to be innocent, and it will all go away. You know what's happening today? You know what's happening around this world today in the religious circles? Baptisms are taking place. Today as we sit in this house of God, there are places like the Church of Christ who are baptizing people hoping that the baptismal water will wash away their sins. I'm not making fun. I'm not picking on anybody. I'm not trying to anyway. But I want you to understand that the water in that baptismal has never washed anybody's sins away. Amen. Only the blood of Christ can do that. Amen. People in Methodist churches are being sprinkled hoping that it will remove the stain of sin. Presbyterians all over the country are baptizing uh, babies, infants, that have no way, there's no way that they're able to understand or make a conscious decision, none whatsoever, and they're hoping that because of something they did when that, when that kid was a baby, will get them into heaven. By the way, there's been many Baptists calling themselves Baptists who have been through that same baptismal water back here, hoping that that was enough. Sitting in Baptist churches today, hoping that they can blend in with the crowd that God will overlook and just let it slide by. And I'll tell you something if baptism is all you've got going for you, if that's all we've got, we'll end up in hell. What else? What's going on in the world today? What about religion? Pentecostals are speaking in tongues. The Catholics are kneeling and chanting. The Methodists are lighting candles. The Cowboy Church is camp meeting, camp firing. The Church of Christ is singing a cappella. The Baptists are preaching and shouting all over the world today. And you can be involved in all of that and still miss heaven, avoiding the issue. Avoiding the decision to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I know some people personally who have tried. They've tried every religious thing that they know to do. I talked to one lady. I said, tell me about when you were saved. And she said, which time? She said, I've been in every church in this county and I got saved in every one of them. I said, no, that's not the way it works. I talked to a man one time. Tell me about your salvation. He said, I've been baptized in every denomination that I can find. Hoping that I've covered all my bases. Friends, listen. You can cover all the religious bases and still end up in hell. Preacher, what can I do? What can I do? Friend, you must be born again. That's what the Bible says. You must be saved. You must acknowledge in your heart that you're lost in sin and separated from God. You must turn to Christ in your heart and accept Him as your own personal Savior by faith. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You must be born again. What shall I do with Jesus? First of all, I want to say this in closing. The option to crucify him again is off the table. Off the table. The book of Hebrews tells us that Christ was crucified and he offered himself once. And that the next time, the second time that he comes, he'll be coming with, without sin unto salvation. That is, he's not coming to be crucified again. Jesus not coming as the, as the lamb slain again. He's coming the next time as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The option to crucify again is off the table. Preacher, why are, you telling us, why, why are you telling us this? Because there's some folks today around about that are teaching people, teaching you, if, that if you'll let them, that, they, that you can lose your salvation. You can lose your salvation. I want to say this to you. Christ died once. Christ was crucified once. Christ offered himself once. And you're saved once. 
and for all eternity. You can choose to be saved, that's your decision. But after you're saved, you can never be lost again. After you've been born again, you can't be unborn. The option to crucify is off the table. He's already died for your sin. However, you have the option, one option is to carry the guilt of sin all on yourself. I'll take what I've got coming. That's what the mob said. Let, the, let, let, let it be on us. Let the innocent blood be upon me. I'll just take my punishment, whatever it is. I'm sure if that's you this morning and in your mind, I'm sure that that sounds real tough and real big of you to say, well, I'll just take what I've got coming. I want to tell you something this morning, friend. Hell will be more than you can stand. Whatever it is you think you can stand, it'll be more than you can stand. All you'll be able to think about for eternity is how you missed the opportunity to be saved. But you have the option to carry the guilt on yourself. But the Bible, thank God, gives us another option. It tells us that we can roll the burden of our sin over on Christ. We can roll it over on Him. And let Him be the bearer of our sin. By faith, allow Him to take away our sin. Let His saving blood be upon me. And wash me white as snow. You can be saved this morning if you'll turn to Christ and trust Him. What are you going to do with Jesus? If you need to make a decision today, would you come as we stand and sing a verse of invitation?